We're joined today by Dr. Lu Lu. She is an assistant professor at Temple University. Back in May, Temple conducted a national study looking at people's perspective on utilizing the hospitality industry services following the coronavirus-related quarantine. Were there any big surprises in the results that you saw? Um, I wouldn't necessarily see this as a big surprise, but it's definitely good news. Um, so this is something interesting I would like to share, because considering the pandemic and how it devastated our industry, especially hospitality and travel, you would think that people are very apprehensive to dine out and to visit those businesses. But actually, according to our findings, people miss restaurants. So certainly for um, some types of hospitality business, people are dying to go out and try them after, you know, the state uh, they stay at home order is lifted. For example, quick service restaurant, casual dining, fine dining, and as well as your coffee shops, local bakeries, neighborhood like that. Um, so this is definitely some interesting news we have seen here. Um, but of course, on the other side, for other sectors, um, that require indoor gathering uh, group activities that we have seen customers still very apprehensive. They don't want to try. Uh, for example, you know, let's say crews or indoor concerts or performance movie theater and the meetings, conferences, etc. So for these, customers are still indicated for the rest of the year of 2020, uh, their patronage levels will remain very low, will be much less than before. How significant of a factor was fear of, contact, of contracting the coronavirus uh, regarding someone's willingness to travel? Oh, that's a really good question. Actually, we did ask this question. We have a list of concerning factors that people may have in mind with the travel. According to our findings, the fear of contracting COVID-19 is the top factor. People are rated among all these. So people are definitely are scared of contracting COVID again. Did this also have an impact on perhaps where or how far someone was willing to travel? Uh, that's a really interesting question again. So uh, part of finding that we ask people what type of travel they're going to take. So we have domestic travel, international travel, and we have local travel and travel for leisure, travel for business. So interestingly, we, our results showed that majority of people uh, are willing to only take domestic or local travel. So they're not going to do international. Um, they're not ready. They're not prepared. Has the inconvenience or uncertainty of coronavirus-related travel restrictions have played much of a role in terms of people's perspectives on travel? So according to our results, uh, part of the finding actually speaks to that point. Um, remember, we had a list of concerning factors of why people are not willing to travel if they're concerned. Part of the factor that uh, associated with that is they are concerned about the destination and is hospitality business are not fully recovered. And so that is a very a concerning factor. They rate it high. And also another factor is um, the potential hassles of cancel trips, cancel flights, and uh, their reservation of being canceled. So these hassles are also another concerning factor people indicated uh, would be the key uh, determining uh, factor that they're not going to Beyond travel, you also mentioned the issue of dining out. Can you talk a little bit about the trends that you saw regarding not only people's willingness to dine out, but where they would like to frequent? Absolutely. Um, so according to our results, as I indicated earlier, uh, we asked people for the rest of the year 2020 what type of business compared to their visit uh, consumption levels before, like before March 2020, for the rest of the year, how the consumption patterns will change. So I indicated earlier, you know, for restaurants, uh, anywhere, you know, from quick service to uh, casual dining to fine dining, people are dying to try out. Uh, however, we also ask people what type of services from these restaurants they're willing to try. So interestingly, we have seen those alternative services we have seen during the pandemic, for example, uh, curbside pickup, delivery, drive through uh, We have seen people have strong interest are going to continue to use this. And this is consistent from quick service, fast casual to casual dining. Uh, we have seen more than anywhere ranging between 60% to 80% people indicated that for these type of services, they're going to continue to use. What kind of leisure activities do you see being most disrupted by uh, the, the long time, uh, several months of quarantine? How has that affected behaviors? Uh, leisure activities, uh, according to our finding, because uh, pretty much I'm trying to see how, however our data could support this, uh, I definitely can see uh, activities that have to be performed indoor, for example, nightclubs, and for example, concerts, movie theater, and uh, cruise, especially long, like, like week-long or month-long cruise. 
customer still very fear of trying out bees. Um, but interestingly, we have seen, we do have a question particularly asked about people's intentions to pursue like a, like a weekend getaway cruise. Uh, we have seen a little better results with that regard. So we anticipate if the cruise industry keep the offering like very short and to make sure all the safety and health practices are in place, there might be a demand with short trips, but not long. The survey also looked at safety and cleanliness protocols that businesses were using as they opened their doors once again. Which of these procedures were most important to the, the comfort and ease of, of the consumers that may be returning to these businesses? So basically our finding shows uh, there are two things. So first of all, we ask people what kind of safety and health measures that they believe to be really important for them to come back to their business. We have a whole list of factors. So I'm only going to mention a few things that more than 50% customers are rated considering to be the most important factors. So comes on top is providing sanitizing products for customers and also enforcing social distancing uh, in the shared space and also make sure their employees are wearing masks and protected gear. So those are the things customers do believe very important. Um, so for the rest, people are still considering important, for example, a uh, temperature check for employees, customers, and minimize direct human contact and provide single-use items uh, for those things customers still believe important, but not as much as those three I mentioned earlier. Over the past few months, several businesses were shuttered and the unemployment rate grew. How much of a factor were economic factors uh, regarding someone's willingness to utilize and return to hospitality amenities once again? Uh, if I understand the question clearly, um, one question I think from our survey came out um, because of the, the disruption of their income and employment status, that is a one of the concerning factors they are not going to travel. So this is from our survey. Other than that, I don't think we have any other direct input to support this. Drawing from the results of the survey that Temple just conducted last month, what conclusions can you draw about the future of the hospitality industry moving forward? Yeah, thank you for this good question. I think overall, as I indicated earlier, uh, for those uh, hospital sectors, for the services that support customers' daily consumptions, we definitely see a positive sign. Customers are missing these uh, their experiences with restaurants, with local cafe shops, and those daily activity they can consume before, and uh, we definitely can see the consumption demand remains strong. However, I think um, given the fact that consumer confidence is the engine to restart the hospitality and the tourism industry, uh, given the pandemic, but I do think it's our responsibility that we implement those health and safety measures to make sure customers are clearly seeing that we're making the effort to make sure they are going to be served safely. We give them the confidence. So I think by joining the effort between the customer and the business, we are going to embrace a successful recovery of the pandemic. Dr. Lu Lu is an assistant professor from Temple University. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. The eyes of the nation are on Pennsylvania as a key influencer to the 2020 election. PCN has over 25 years of trusted state government coverage. Our network is your platform to connect directly with Pennsylvania voters. Whether it's a presidential race, statewide campaign, or local cause, our viewers are ready to hear from you. Book your ad now. PCN, your access to Pennsylvania voters. We're joined today by Joellen Litz. She is a Lebanon County Commissioner. The governor just announced today that on July 3rd, Lebanon will finally move to the green phase of reopening. Lebanon County was the last county to remain in the, the yellow phase, which is a little bit more restrictive. Do you think that the county is ready to move forward with this? I know we're ready. We have a lot of good people in this community and together we can do this. Back in May, the two Republican county commissioners passed a resolution to advance the county to reopening uh, to the yellow phase in advance of the governor's pace. Do you think that this contributed in any way to Lebanon County being the last county to move to the green phase? There were numerous different things that contributed. I can't rule that out as one, but we also had at that time um, pro protests going on. We had the elections going on where people went out to vote. We also had a holiday in there. 
So uh, all of these things together contributed to the uptick we saw of 21, 41 in a day. And now it's on the way down again, 10, 11, 6. So it's trending in the right direction. Republican state lawmakers from the county's delegation had characterized the decision to keep Lebanon in the yellow phase as the last one as being a political decision. Do you think politics played any role at all? I can't speak for those who participated on the other side. I just know that my decision uh, was one where I, I thought about all of the things that I do to protect my health. I brush my teeth every day. I exercise. I try and eat healthy foods. I admit I like sweets too, but for the most part, I think we all try and do things that help to keep us healthy. And it's a proven fact that wearing masks helps to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. On top of that, if we social distance and we um, wash our hands, these are all things that are common sense issues in order to stay healthy and help others to stay healthy. How would you describe the number of cases in Lebanon County right now? Could you repeat that? How would you describe the, the number or the level of coronavirus cases in Lebanon County at this time? They're on the decline, and I think that that's a good thing. What do you think needs to occur perhaps additionally to keep those numbers down? What we can do to keep those numbers down is to wear a mask when we go into stores or restaurants. I'm not saying stay home. We want businesses to open. We want people to get back to their jobs. We want our economy to thrive, but we want to do it in the right way and to protect not just ourselves, but others. And that is by following the CDC guidelines, the recommendations from the Department of Health and others in authority. How is Lebanon County faring in access to state or federal recovery money? Money, the money did you ask? Thank you. I think right now we're doing okay because we have citizens who take their uh, duty to pay their taxes very seriously and they are coming in. Uh, we did extend the time that they had to pay them in the discount period and the standard period. But on the other hand, they are coming in steadily so we are able to keep up with expenses. We can't stop providing services to the most vulnerable citizens just because we're in a pandemic. We still have to investigate child abuse cases. We still have to take care of people with mental health or intellectual disability. We have a 911 center to run to dispatch fire, police, ambulance, and hazardous materials. So our job is one that we cannot walk away from. It goes on 24 seven most times. Have you been able to assess how many businesses have fared uh, in light of the coronavirus over the last few months? The businesses are stressed and they're anxious to open, but they're also, I think they also know that if they do it without the right circumstances or rushing, that it could go the wrong way and then we'd be drawn back into red. None of us wants that. So by following the same guidelines that we're, we're following as individuals, they can post no shoes, no shirt, no mask, no service. That's a very basic thing. They can set their tables six feet apart and in the bathroom maybe increase the number of times that that's sanitized in a day. I know the state parks are doing their toilets uh, twice a day. So instead of cleaning them once a day, get in there twice a day and help to keep those germs in check. What resources well, remain available for county businesses that may need some sort of financial assistance? Well, number one, they too can delay when they pay their taxes because that was not just for individuals, that was also for businesses. But we also are receiving $12.8 million in CARES funding. And in there, there is a component for businesses with 100 or less employees where we will be able to provide some financial assistance for business loss. And our Economic Development Corporation is going to work with businesses over 100 employees. We have an element for nonprofits and we have um, tourism in there. And I'm, I'm missing a, a category, I'm sure. But the point is we have reached out in our community 
to organizations that have automatic membership lists and know who these people are, are familiar with what they go through on a daily basis. So the Chamber of Commerce is going to accept the applications for the businesses and the EDC for the larger businesses will accept the applications and the nonprofits will be accepted by the United Way. So we think we've chosen well-known and established um, entities in the community to help us with the process. They will compile lists, say these people met the, the criteria, submit it to the county commissioners, we will review that list, and then it'll be a yay or nay on our part to see that they get the funding. So we try to streamline it and make it as simple as possible and efficient for our businesses so that they can, you know, get people back to work and pay their bills as well. As I mentioned already, <laughs> Lebanon County moves to the green phase on July 3rd. What message do you have for residents and county businesses that may have been impatient uh, regarding the pace of reopening? Well, I know I try and patronize local businesses. And by patronizing local businesses, I think that that helps to preserve jobs and um, the businesses themselves. So that we can all follow through with this, I do know that there is a workplace safety and a business safety order in place um, by the state. So we have to follow those guidelines. We want to make sure that we don't get slapped with any fines or you know, licenses withdrawn, or at the worst case scenario, you go back into red and have businesses closed completely. We don't want that. Again, we want businesses to survive. We want people to have jobs. We want our economy to thrive. And to do that, we have to work together as a team. So anybody who was, you know, hesitating, please get on board and pass that message. Uh, your employees have to wear masks and the patrons have to wear masks. That's what the orders are right now. Lebanon County Commissioner Joe Ellen Litz, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. The Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission is dedicated to informing the public about the diminishing access to housing. Chad Dion Lassiter is the executive director of PHRC, the top civil rights enforcement agency in Pennsylvania. He and his guests will discuss the systemic problems of discrimination and bias that limits access to the basic need of housing. Watch on cable and streaming free this Sunday at 3 p.m. Get more at PCNTV.com. We're joined today by State Representative Frank Ryan. You represent Lebanon County, which will be the last county to move into the green phase of reopening on July 3rd. Why do you think that this was the last county uh, to move forward? First of all, I, I personally think that some of the data and the metrics that were being used were inaccurately looked at. Uh, I'm a CPA and I have a fairly extensive economics background. I taught economics at Franklin and Marshall for about 10 years as an adjunct faculty member. And there's multiple ways you can look at the same data. We were having a significantly declining trend to begin with. So when we really stepped up, when tests became more available and we started testing senior centers, which had been born the brunt of the COVID-19 outbreak to begin with, it would be expected that you would find a an increase in the numbers just by the sheer volume of the increase in number of tests. So I'm very proud that the county commissioners and the uh, and others worked to make sure that we got those testing done. And as a result, I think the administration, did, uh, particularly the uh, Department of Health, were looking at the data perhaps incorrectly. Metrics drive a lot of things, but they've got to be looked at appropriately. There was a joint letter that you and other members of the Lebanon County delegation had put out to the county uh, residents where they said, where you said that the uh, decision to keep Lebanon County as the last county in the yellow phase was a punitive decision and motivated by politics. Why do you think that? I think there's a number of factors. And, and since we've now uh, somewhat resolved some of the issue with going green, Lebanon County and, and our commissioners and candidly Senator Arnold, uh, Russ Diamond, uh, Sue Helm for the part of the county she has and myself, have been leading the effort for quite some time along with Senator Doug Mastriano from York County and from uh, Adams County area saying, look, we really need to get a more appropriate balance on this understanding of what the metrics are that are being used. And they, I was very pleased with the Senate and the House leadership team, Senator Corman, uh, at the time Speaker Torzai and, and now uh, Speaker Cutler, which is a new change as well, uh, that they had helped us get some of these legislations across saying that we knew 
that things were not being applied pr- appropriately and fairly, candidly, Francine, throughout the state. As an example, what happened with the nursing homes? Uh, the At the time, Speaker Torres, I sent a letter out to the Secretary of Health asking for a clear understanding of the metrics. Uh, he has a fairly extensive background in, in public health. Uh, you know, I do too. I spent 28 years on the hospital board of directors. And we were seeing things entirely different than the Department of Health was. So we believe it was important to look at it and get the county over up. So we think the governor's approach was because we led with the effort of House Resolution 836 to end the emergency declaration, that there might have been some hard feelings. I don't know if it was a governor who did it, but perhaps some other people uh, on his team that felt that that would be the appropriate response. And I'm glad to see uh, that he subsequently backed off and that hopefully this dialogue can be open to where we can get back on with fixing the Commonwealth and get our economy and the long-term health of our community back under control. How transparent has the administration been with the data they're utilizing to determine the pace of reopening? And not at all. And that's, I think, probably the biggest issue. The right to know office was closed, uh, which has got me extraordinarily concerned. Uh, the other aspect of it is just in my own county, we pulled together a specific set of de- uh, data with Representative Seth Grove, who's done a phenomenal effort in pulling this together. And we sat down and created our own data sets. I had some individual uh, statisticians locally who were able to help me pull together the data. And we pulled together pretty close to a excess of 500 page document about different ways of examining the same type of data. I use an analogy today that if you want to do a perfect correlation coefficient, you could come out and make the absurd comment that the leading cause of death is birth, but there's no substantive value to that comment. So I would say the same thing. If you look at data incorrectly, you'll draw the wrong conclusion. Our goal is and has been in the House of Representatives and the Senate to protect the long-term health of our citizens and the budget impact on the decisions to do a catastrophic shutdown of the economy in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania will have undue and destructive impact in the Commonwealth in the budget negotiations that we're gonna go into in November. And next year's budget, I was talking to Representative Seth Grove today, next year's budget will be even worse than the negotiations that we're gonna have to have. How have your constituents, businesses in particular, been impacted by the the quarantine phase and the the limited reopening? You know, I I say this, uh, I encourage everybody to really have as much compassion for one another as you can. And the businesses in our area have been devastated by this. And I would suggest to you that I would encourage each of us to put ourselves in each other person's shoes. I'll give you a different example. Uh, There are three ways that this COVID-19 has affected people. If you are a senior and you've been locked in and quarantined, you're you're missing your family. That isolation has been devastating. And we've had 4,300 people die in senior centers. The essential workers uh, have been real heroes in pulling this together. Our first responders, the doctors, the nurses, the police, the first aid and safety patrol and others have done a great job. And then there's a third group, which we have sadly called non-essential that have basically been saying, well, you really don't matter and we'll get unemployment to you whenever you can. And and so as a result, it's created this divide. Those non-essential workers are essential. They're they're essential to our economy. We can't do without them. And so the businesses have been meeting with me on a regular basis. You know, I came from a very poor family. My dad died when I was three. And my career as a CPA is I specialize in keeping companies out of bankruptcy. I will tell you the trauma that my staff has heard from citizens who can't make ends meet, who can't put food on the table for their children is palpable. And I would encourage anyone who has not been affected by this crisis, if you're getting a retirement income check, if you've got a stimulus check, and the worst thing that's happened to you is that you've been inconvenienced, put yourself in the perspective of that person who may have lost everything and may spend the next 10 years digging out of a decision that someone else made that they had no input into at all. Do you think it further hurt Lebanon County businesses that being the last county currently as we speak in the green phase, or I'm sorry, in the yellow phase, they'll be the last one to move to the green, that neighboring counties um, moved ahead a little bit at a faster pace. And so residents could perhaps go frequent businesses right across the border when Lebanon County businesses were still perhaps shuttered. I, I tell, used to tell my students this all the time. If we have all failed an F minus versus an F is not much different everyone has been negatively impacted by the way this was done. And we are seeing unbelievable negative impacts. We don't know yet how the economy is gonna come back. I'll give you an example. We already know this fiscal year alone, 
We're $4 billion short. We have a massive cash flow. I mean, massive cash flow problem coming at the end of September to where we will have to borrow money or transfer money out of the special funds in order just to be able to pay payrolls and pay our accounts payable in the Commonwealth, which is a sad commentary. And then we have the budgetary impacts. Next year's budget impact could be anywhere from $2 billion to $4 billion. Uh, if fortunately, other states in the nation have reopened. The hospitals have asked for a $7 billion bailout. Senior care facilities have asked for a $2 billion bailout. We haven't gotten the June 30th numbers for the pensions. I'm the vice chairman of the PSERS board of directors. But looking at the assumed rate of return of 7.25% for PSERS and 7.125% for SERS, that difference between what we should have earned and what the final number will be could be as much as a $10 billion difference. The total price tag for this entire thing will be about $30 billion. And that is a, almost about 85% of what the budget will be. I saw this happen in Maryland in 2008 when major social welfare programs were curtailed because of the housing bubble bursting. That was mild in comparison to what we're going to see here. Is there another phase after the green phase or is this the new normal, do you think, until a vaccine becomes readily available? I'm hoping that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court rules and makes a decision and says that the House Resolution 836 takes effect and the emergency declaration is ended. I got a great briefing uh, not too recently from a group of investment advisors who said, uh, we will never get to a point where all the different strains of COVID-19 have been, have been conquered so that we need to learn some way to live in consolation with this. We, we need to recognize that we do need to uh, understand that we have to use normal hygiene practices that I thought most of us were taught when we were children definitely in health classes. What we need to be respectful of one another in all separate ways. If someone's got emphysema, it may not be a good idea for them to wear a mask, as an example. Some people have different perspectives to the mask than others do. We have to understand that, but we need to uh, work together as much as we possibly can to get this down. If this is the new normal, I will tell you the catastrophic effects of a new normal, the way they're structured, even in the green phase, will be disastrous. A restaurant, as an example, Chunky Cheese just went bankrupt yesterday. You can't survive on 50% of the business. And that's true of shopping malls. It's true of everything. We have to be very careful in the way we, we redo this. I had to do this kind of thing in the Marine Corps as a commanding officer of the Civil Affairs Unit, and it's a challenge. And we better be careful or the consequences of this will be felt forever. Since you brought up the issue of wearing masks, the Bipartisan Management Committee has a policy now enacted that requires lawmakers to wear masks. How do you feel about that? I, I am concerned about anything. I, I'll give you an example about that. We have some members uh, that, that have predisposition to emphysema. We have others who have lung issues. They can't breathe with the mask on. And, and it's a problem. I'm in really good physical condition, but if I'm walking up and down the steps, at age 69, I, I will tell you that as an example, I, my normal resting pulse is 55. I'm in really good health. But when I put the mask on, my resting pulse is almost 80. And when you look at that, you, we have to be understanding one another. Now, if someone's coughing at another person, that's wrong. So to answer your question very specifically, I'm concerned about anything that's mandatory. First of all, I'm not completely convinced it's enforceable. Because even by the Constitution, you can't stop someone. A police If I'm on my way to session and a police officer stops me, short of it being a felony, I can't be stopped. And so I will tell you that denying 65,000 people their representative on the House floor is a challenge. We do have alternative ways of going on session. Uh, and so only time will tell. Uh, I think it was a, a solution that was due to the emotions of the time. But I do fear that if all of a sudden we have to start everyone disclose their own medical records, do you think someone really wants to have someone say, okay, by the way, by the way, I don't, it's not like I have emphysema, I have high blood pressure, I have this, I have that. Do we want those medical issues broadcast across the board? Because if we start doing that, I think you'll see that the great strides we made at confidentiality in healthcare will have been lost overnight. Now, you mentioned a moment ago the issue of the governor's disaster declaration is currently before the, uh, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. That being said, is there any legal precedent that we can look to that talks a little bit about the balance between personal freedoms and protecting public health? 
yeah, it's called the 14th Amendment. And uh, I think what you'll find is that the 14th Amendment is crystal clear that the application of the uh, amendments to the Constitution, particularly the Bill of Rights, applies to the states as well. And that so as a result, an emergency declaration that unjustly restricts the freedoms under the Bill of Rights of those citizens would be challenged. I would encourage people on both sides of the aisle to get behind, behind this in one way, shape, or form. The law in 1978 that was done when we had complete control of the House, the Senate, and the governor's office by one party is a challenge because that's when we start passing laws. Uh, I was not happy as an example when the Patriot Act passed, and I was very clear when I ran for Congress that I didn't feel that that was a good bill, and we're seeing the consequences of that now. I will tell you, we're just now beginning to feel the disaster effect, disastrous effects of the law that was passed in 1955 for the Public Health Act in 1978. It was never intended to be used in this purpose. And so I'm hoping that the Supreme Court will lay aside its political perspective on this and say, what is in the best public policy? I don't think there's anybody, Francine, that challenged the first 30 days of this. Uh, we were disappointed that the governor was not more transparent with the leadership teams. I can tell you on a number of occasions, the governor's staff met with our leadership team to have a major announcement made three hours later that was not briefed to the leadership team earlier. That's just not a good way to do it. Our neighboring state of Maryland did it exactly opposite. And there they have a Republican governor and a Democrat House and Senate. And as a result, they sat down and said, we need to get the counties involved. We need to get you involved. So I've got a bill that specifically creates an interagency task force should something like this happen again so that we can ensure that we balance out those proper freedoms and protections for all of our citizens, while at the same time, we combat a deadly disease. Particularly at a time where as of July 3rd, all of Pennsylvania's counties will be in the green phase. What gets accomplished by attempting to end the governor's disaster declaration now? At this point, keep in mind, green is not open. Green is just a difference of less restrictive. So uh, when you end the emergency declaration, I think what it does is it forces the Secretary of Health, the governor, and the House and the Senate to sit down and come up with a rational solution. We all want to protect the public safety. We all do. Uh, we just passed two bills this past week on police reforms. And so I, I think it's important that we understand that we have the same objective. But what we want is we want to make sure that the needs and the interest and the perspective of all of those of us that have been uh, elected to represent our individual constituents are part of that discussion, and it's not one person and their Secretary of Health. I will tell you what happened this past time, regardless of the emergency declaration, I guarantee the next Secretary of Health confirmation process will be entirely different than all the ones that have taken place in the past. And I'm sorry to say that that could probably make that person's life absolutely miserable in the process. And I would not be surprised if it prevented the confirmation of a Secretary of Health. One last question before I let you go. Do you anticipate that the House will return to session over the summer? And if so, what do you expect to work on? I do. Um, I believe the cash flow concerns are fairly significant. Uh, the Senate is, is in session next week. Uh, one of those bills is my pay freeze bill for legislators. That's on third consideration. Hopefully that gets passed into the governor's office. Um, it might go straight on. Uh, I suspect that if there are any bills on concurrence, we might have to come back for a while. We do have a significant amount of budget work that has to happen. So I anticipate a lot of committee hearings. I'm on the Aging and Adult Services, Older Adult Services Committee. We had a committee hearing yesterday, probably every Thursday going forward. I'm certain that appropriations will be meeting over the summer uh, because we have a ton of work to do. This, will, this November will probably be one of the ugliest budget sessions until next year, which will be significantly more ugly when we come to deal with the vagaries of the cash flow problems we have. Representative Frank Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. It was great again to see you. Thanks again, Francine.